Well, hello everybody. It's uh, Wednesday, March the 18th, uh, coming to you live from my office here in Inferno Hall. Uh, it's definitely strange. I'm absolutely the only person in the building, uh, which um, I guess is to be expected given circumstances, but uh, here I am. Uh, what we're going to talk about today uh, is multi-state models. Uh, some of you may have noticed already that I also posted a partial lecture from Gary White, the guy who wrote Program Mark, who I've mentioned more than a few times during lectures back when we were actually having real lectures. And so it's kind of interesting for you, I'm sure, to see Gary and to uh, see him introduce some of what we're going to talk about today. So I'm going to cover somewhat similar ground, but I'm going to take a uh, slightly more leisurely stroll through various things. And then as we progress through the lecture, I'm actually going to talk about a couple of worked examples just to see how multi-state models work in MARC. And multi-state models really are an important um, data type to be aware of and to get some familiarity with because they are extremely general, very flexible. There are large groups of people who basically come from the perspective that any particular model that you might want to build is basically just a multi-state model in disguise. And we'll actually look at uh, an example of doing that later on in the lecture. And so I wanted to just uh, alert you to the motivation for looking at multi-state models. One of them was um, the point that we made uh, near the end of the individual covariate lecture. Multi-state models provide one approach to handling missing temporally varying covariates. You can simply structure the whole thing as a multi-state problem. And this is discussed in, in length in uh, chapter 11 in the book. Uh, today we're going to just focus on multi-state models in the general sense. We'll look at a couple of applied examples. The multi-state models in the book are covered in chapter 10, which is the chapter that you would need to refer to for the specific details. Again, the only way this is going to work is if we use lecture to introduce big ideas and then place uh, some of the burden of learning the fine-tuned details on you by working through uh, the materials that I will email you uh, in this case, specific sections in chapter 10 in the book. All right, so let's go ahead and, and, and proceed here. Um, the basic idea with multi-state models is probably obvious by the name. We have multiple states that we're interested in. Um, a little bit of the history just to cover what Gary uh, talked about. Um, these really began with Neil Arneson, who's uh, this character here that I'm uh, moving the cursor over, he's a uh, recently retired professor in biological statistics at the University of Manitoba in Winnipeg, in Manitoba, one of the provinces in Canada, uh, my hometown, actually. And Neil was uh, extremely far ahead of the curve. He did his, his thesis work and his major contributions were in 1972, 1973. And they sat dormant. This was all pre-internet, pre-World Wide Web. You know, the only way you found things is spending quality time in the library flipping through journals, which I can tell you from having done that at one point in my career is not the most exciting thing to do, uh, or is it the most efficient? But, but Neil did just spectacularly uh, groundbreaking work, uh, derived the basic ideas behind multi-state models, and they sat and they sat and they sat. And nobody did much with them until he brought in a PhD student, Carl Schwartz, who's the dapper looking guy to, to Neil's right with the mustache. Carl is a, also a recently retired professor at Simon Fraser University up in Vancouver, where I actually spent six years before I came to Cornell. And Carl was one of those spectacular students who comes along uh, once in a while, looked at Neil's work, and just carried it much, much further and did really groundbreaking um, developments that we still largely work on today. Um, the thing that Carl's work, though, did uh, was primarily focused in on a couple of questions, but he also primarily focused on fish. So people who weren't really interested in fish taxa as a group uh, didn't really see a lot of Carl's work either. And then a woman named Cavell Brownie, who is down here in sort of the lower left, she got recruited. She was a professor of stats and chair of the stats department at North Carolina State. Um, and I think she was the chair of the stats department when Steve Elner was there. I'm not positive. And so she got recruited. And what Cavell did in combination with this character here in the lower right, this is Jim Nichols being pretend arrested in Guam. Um, Jim is one of those few times in my life that I can actually say that I've met and worked with a genius. Jim is the most self-effacing, quiet, gentle guy you'll ever meet who also happens to have written 600 papers and 14 books, and is probably the single most important person in mark recapture theory in history, because what Jim could do that was unique is he could read the papers by guys like Neil and Carl, 
and Cavell, who is a statistician, and immediately see the 20 different ways that that idea could be applied to real problems in ecology and, uh, and biological statistics and evolutionary biology. So it's, it's sort of become a cliche, but it's true. If you want to keep up on the f in the field, you simply read everything that Jim Nichols has ever done, and you can't read them all because he's written so many papers. But if you see a paper by Jim Nichols, read it. It's characterized by both being very easy to read, but also at the end of it, you have that moment where you kind of go, that's so obvious, why didn't I think of it? And the answer is because you're not Jim Nichols. And so I'm very fortunate to have done one of my postdocs with Jim Nichols. Uh, he's just frighteningly brilliant, but is also one of the nicest people that I ever met. And uh, it's, it's, it's kind of reassuring to know that you can be normal and, and brilliant at the same time. Not that I would know about part of that. Uh, actually, I wouldn't know about being normal either, but so be it. So these are the main characters, and their first major application was on some work based on Canada Goose movement uh, biology in the winter. And this was something that a guy named Jay Hespeck did. And, and then Jim came along in 94 and really kind of ramped it up. He looked at everything that everybody done and said, oh, here's all the different ways that we can apply this in interesting um, applications. And so the, the basic idea was simple. So this is just a, a simplified, stylized version of what Gary showed in his uh, presentation, which is largely based upon the Canada Goose Movement model. It was, the idea was motivated by imagining that you have physical locations and you're interested in the movement of individuals from the locations. Now, clearly the individual movement is going to be conditional on a couple of things. In order to move, they have to survive. And if they survive, then they flip a coin to they move or not. So when you look at a structure like this, and it was originally motivated by these physical locations, this was really um, generated a lot of interest because at the time this came out, metapopulation theory was all the rage. And it's still fundamentally important because we imagine that habitat fragmentation and movement of individuals amongst habitat locations is extremely important. And so from the management and the conservation perspective, doing the modeling is one thing, but what multi-state models allow you to do is to actually estimate the parameters. And for some of you, at least, the ones who took 4100, you're going to look at these sorts of diagrams and you're going to potentially remember that they look like uh, life cycle diagrams that we talked a fair bit about in 4100, and they're exactly the same thing. And now we deal in, in this class with how do you actually estimate some of the parameters that might go into some of those life cycle diagrams. And so again, this whole kind of weird circle of life thing, all these courses start to integrate together uh, in your senior year, um, such as it is. All right, so there's a kind of an overview starting point. Three locations, A, B, and C. There's the probability that an individual, for example, could stay in B. There's a probability that it could go from B to A and, and all the other permutations that you see here. But what Jim Nichols did when he came along and looked at this is he realized very early on, and of course it seems obvious when you say it, but Jim was a, was a master of spotting the obvious, it can be generalized beyond thinking about animals moving amongst locations. And, and here's a generalization that we'll, we'll start with, and we'll look at a couple of different permutations of this in the next few slides. Imagine you have two different states. So rather than thinking about a location, just think about a state that an organism can exist in, and we call them A or B. So we simplify here. We have simply have two states. So a multi-state model needs minimally two states, or it's not a multi-state model. Here we have A and B, and we have these transitions that exist either between the two states or the probability or the transition probability of staying within the state. And so if you just stare at this for a few seconds, you'll, you'll see how it works. Now, what's important here, when you look at the notation for the first time, we're going to have the letter I, again, to indicate the time interval or the sampling interval. And now we have a superscript. And the superscript is to indicate the states that are involved in the particular transition. And unlike the way that some of the superscripts and subscripts are indexed in other courses that some of you have taken with me, these are actually read left to right. So psi AA is the probability that if you're in A, that you stay in A. Psi BA is the probability that if you're in B at the beginning of the interval, that you transition and move to A. And so you'll, you'll see um, that the first letter is where you are, and the second letter is where you're going to go to. And so AB is the probability of going from A to B over interval I, and, and so on. So it won't take you very long to kind of figure this out. Okay. So 
Now let's pretend that we're Jim Nichols and very clever. So one of the things that Jim did early on was he said, well, let's think about what interesting biological states might be. And one of the first things that he worked on was the concept of breeding. So an individual female organism, let's assume a sexually breeding organism, can exist in one of two states. It's either a breeding individual in a particular year or it's a non-breeding individual. And a lot of the life history theory that you learn in a evolutionary biology class is premised upon this idea of a trade-off between breeding and non-breeding. Breeding makes babies, which obviously improves your fitness, but breeding is also physiologically expensive and costly and might reduce your survival. And so the idea of breeding making babies being traded off against the cost of breeding or cost of reproduction is what it's usually referred to is very important. So the theory has been out there for a long time. Fisher did it and a lot of people after Fisher did a lot of, of that kind of work. Lamont Cole uh, is very famous for that and he was a professor over in the what's now the E&EB department. He was actually one of my, my dad's supervisors when my dad was doing his PhD work here in the 50s. Um, so the theory was there and it makes perfect sense. You know, energy you spend on making babies is energy you don't spend on survival. So trade-off made sense. And a lot of life history theory is predicated on that trade-off being true without good empirical support for it being true. So then Nichols comes along and says, well, you know, if you can assign an individual to a breeding state, breeder or non-breeder, then we can calculate the probabilities of moving back and forth between the states. And part of that probability is the probability of survival. So is the probability of going from breeder to non-breeder different than the probability of going from non-breeder back to breeder? And so embedded in the diagram that, that you're looking at as you listen to this are some of the elements that we need to explore if we really want to pull apart things like the cost of reproduction as it relates to life history theory and life history trade-offs. Okay. Now here's one that's going to be extremely relevant given the present circumstances. And I didn't put this in just to be clever. This has been in there for a while. And, and Jim Nichols and I and a few other people have been haranguing the medical community for years that they really, really do need to deal with this. And so here's a very simplified version of what might be an SIR kind of model. In fact, it's an SIS model explicitly, where you have two states, healthy and diseased, and the probabilities of moving relate to infection and recovery. And then there's a probability that if an individual is diseased, it stays diseased. If it's healthy, it stays healthy. And so clearly, given the current you know, um, backdrop that, that we're all living under, this is particularly relevant. What makes this, you know, I think extra important is that because this is going to be a model that we frame within the same kind of constructs that we've done for mark recapture and Cormac Jolly Sieber models, we explicitly are going to deal with detection probability. And the single biggest failing with all of the disease stuff that you often hear is that they don't properly account for detection probability. Is a healthy individual and a diseased individual, are they equally likely to be detected? Well, as you all know now, no, because it's pretty clear from a lot of the data that are finally being collected that a lot of people who are asymptomatic or appear to be healthy actually carry the coronavirus, the COVID-19. And so without correcting for detection probabilities, a lot of the disease models that are sort of oversimplified for the general public would basically be incorrect. So this has been a point that's been raised many, many times. The CDC um, understands this. There's all sorts of collaborations with them to try to improve uh, their ability to handle imperfect detection. But there are still large swaths of public health that aren't aware of this at all. A standard medical school training gives you a couple of weeks in epidemiological theory. And in fact, what you, most of you, or I guess all of you saw in 3100 for the couple of lectures that we did on diseases was, was more advanced than most of what you hear in medical school. So there's clearly an opportunity here in the purely practical sense for people who understand the kinds of models that we're learning about in course to actually go and apply it to something like disease models. And I can pretty well guarantee right now you'd get a lot of attention if this was something that you thought was interesting and were good at. Um, here's another thing. So sometimes you're dealing with circumstances where you, you have two states which are different from each other based upon whether something is ob observable or not. And, and this can also be applied to this disease context just to stay on that theme. Sometimes you can observe that the individual has the disease and sometimes you can't. And so in that case, it's unobservable. And the answer or, or the, the thing that we're dealing with here that's the kind of the nuance is unobservable has a detection probability of zero. By definition, 
If it's unobservable, you don't see it. If you don't see it, detection is zero. So P equals is zero, as we see over here. And the observable state is, is got a P that's at least greater than zero. And so we can be very, very clever with all sorts of things that we can do with multi-state models. Um, here's another example. So suppose that you're working with some uh, annual uh, plant and you go out in year one and you see there's the plant because it's above ground. You go out in year two and you don't see it. So the question you would have is, is it dead or is it dormant? Because in either case, you wouldn't see it anymore. It disappears. If it's dormant, the above ground biomass disappears and everything's below ground. You go out in year three and oh, there it is again. So that tells you something. It clearly wasn't dead. It was dormant. So mark recapture can be applied to um, dead or dormant. And, and one of my ex-students, Brett Sandercock, um, did some postdoc work out at Berkeley doing exactly this sort of stuff. And so, again, most plant biologists aren't aware of this. They assume that because plants don't move, there is no reason to control for detection probability. But in fact, there is. And uh, you can go be a plant biologist and be a god because you know how to do this, and they don't. Um, in the multi-state context, again, this is a life cycle diagram that some of you will remember from 4100. So we have seeds and we have different emergent states and we have the seed bank and we can, we can play all these sorts of games and we can treat literally the whole thing in a multi-state framework correctly accounting for um, imperfect detection. So detection probability is less than one. Okay, so this is the, again, back to the simple kind of very stylized um, one with two states. And the probabilistic transitions between the states are represented here. We're using the letter phi for the moment, and we'll change that in a second. And again, each of these transitions consists of two parts, the where you are and where you're going to. In the language, these you usually refer to as donor and recipient. So where you are is the donor state. Where you're going to end up is the recipient state. And so depending upon who you read or listen to, you'll hear one or the other. Uh, I'll try to be as explicit as, poss as possible without getting too much into, into language. Okay, now the basic parameters are pretty easy. So phi rs with a subscript of i is the probability that an animal alive in state r at time i is alive and in state s at time i plus 1. So time i is the beginning of the interval and i plus 1 is where they end up. R is the state at the beginning of the interval, and S is the state at the end of the interval. Uh, the probability of the animal being detected is a function of the state that they're in at that particular time. So remember, it doesn't go over the interval. And so we simply have P with a superscript for the state that the animal was detected in at time I. So the, the thing which is hidden in here and becomes very important in just a second is that phi rs is the probability of two things happening at once. It's the probability of surviving and moving. And that's something that we're going to need to, to pull apart a little bit. But for now, phi is this sort of product probability of surviving and moving. In the cormac jolly siever context, phi is the probability of surviving and staying, something we talked about very briefly during the kind of scramble on the very last uh, in class lecture that we had, but here it's somewhat similar. So it's a combined joint probability of two things surviving and moving. Okay, so let's, let's look at how you interpret uh, multi state encounter histories. So let's just make sure we're on the right slide here. So here we have um, a system with three states, A, B, and C. So it's analogous to one of the first slides in the presentation. And on the left-hand column here, we see different encounter histories. And on the right, we see the interpretation. Now, the very first thing that you need to notice here, or should notice, is that we no longer are simply using ones or zeros. If we only used ones or zeros, then we can't build a multi-state model. We have to you know, indicate the state. And so in MARC, you can use one, two, three, four, five, up to nine. So you could have nine states, or you can use letters. Um, and you can use uppercase or lowercase. So you have a very, very large number of ways that you could represent a particular state. It's entirely up to you. The only one you can't use is zero. Zero means something very specific. It means you didn't detect it. So in this case, we're using capital A, capital B, and capital C to represent the states A, B, and C respectively. And then the zeros that you see in, in the first two encounter histories represent 
you know, not being detected. So let's just run through the interpretation of the first history, AAB0CC. As noted in the text, you're marked at occasion A, you've seen again at occasion A, uh, um, um, in state A on occasion 2, you see them in state B at occasion 3, you don't see them at all, so the, the text here is suggesting the states are islands, so you don't see them on any of the islands at occasion 4, you see them on island C, at occasion five, and then you see them on island C and occasion six. So again, the challenge that we always face is how do you interpret the zero? Well, the zero we know means that they were alive and not detected. We're assuming, and we'll get explicit about these assumptions later on, that the animal is alive and is either on island A, B, or C. It's nowhere else. It's gotta be on one of those three. We simply don't know where it is for that zero that occurs on the fourth occasion. So based upon the experiences you've had so far, that's the modeling that we need to do. We need to write out the probability expression that corresponds to each of the different ways that we could get that zero. Okay, so the second encounter history, somewhat similar. We've got BA, BA, and then two zeros. So it was on island B, we saw it, we went over to island A, we saw it, went back to island B, we saw it, went back to island A, we saw it, and then we never see it again. So now we're faced with the problem well, maybe we never see it again because it's dead. And did it die on the fifth occasion or did it die on the sixth occasion? Was it in fact alive on one of the islands we just missed it? So terminal zeros are always a pain in the butt if you had to write out the probabilities by hand. We don't. Mark does all this work for us and so on. And then the final encounter history, ACAA. That's, that's really easy. There's no zeros and we know exactly where the animal is and in this case, they mostly stayed on island A, and on the second occasion, they moved over to island C, and we saw them. So again, um, not too different. The main difference is that we use something other than simple ones and zeros to indicate detections. Uh, we use something to indicate the state or the location of the animal when they're detected. Zeros still mean not detected. And, and the, the technical complication that the software will do for us is we now have multiple permutations of how we get uh, a zero. And so we'll look at that uh, in this example. So let's consider just a, what looks superficially to be a simple encounter history, A, zero, and B. So we'll imagine here we only have two states. And so on the first occasion, they're in state A. On the third occasion, they're in state B, so we know that the zero means that they were alive, but we missed them. They're alive, but they could have been on either island, all right? So we were either state. It could have been A, could have been B, we just don't know. So we have to account for both of those. So these two probability expressions that I'm indicating here with the cursor represent the two possible ways that could happen. The individual was in state A on occasion one, could have stayed there and simply been missed with probability one minus PA, and then moved to B and then was detected, or it moved to B between the first and the second occasion and we missed it on B and then it stayed there and was detected. And so you simply write out the probability of the expected frequency of individuals with encounter history A0, B as the number released on, in state A and then the two probabilities. Remember that based upon the laws of probability, if you're saying it could be this encounter history or probability expression or this probability expression, then we add the two together, we sum the two together, and that's the overall probability that gives us the expected frequency of A, zero, B individuals. All right, so a moment ago I mentioned that this phi parameter is essentially the product of two events that occur. It's the product that you survive and the probability that you move. And so we would like to be able to separate those things because a cost of reproduction or some other bits of interesting biology might influence things differently. For example, moving might influence survival or the location, the state might influence survival. Um, or it may influence the probability that you move, all right? So maybe some environmental covariate doesn't influence survival, but maybe it changes the probability of moving from breeding to non-breeding state, which was something we mentioned in passing during our last real lecture. So we'd like to separate phi into the component parts. So all these transitions, how can we actually go ahead and do that? And it's actually pretty easy to do. The basic idea is we're going to um, define two different uh, parameters now. 
S, which is true survival, and psi, the Greek letter psi, which is the movement probability. So conditional upon the assumption that if the animal is alive, it stays within the states of your system. So in this example that you see in the diagram, there's two states, A and B. So conditional upon surviving, then the animal flips a coin to either stay or move. And the way that Mark is set up is that that's the actual sequence of events that we believe occurs in that order. Most of the time, the order doesn't matter. Some of the times it does, so you need to be aware of what Mark assumes. And for an awful lot of organisms, the survive and then move works pretty well. So if you stare at these things, and I'm, so I'm looking at, let's look at, at this particular transition. You're in state B, a time I. You survive, so the, the survival coin gets flipped. And conditional upon surviving, you either stay in B or you go over to A. And so here, what we're doing is we're basically going from B to A, so psi with the superscript BA. And so the overall probability expression then is the product. You flip the coin, survive, and then conditional upon surviving, you either move psi BA or you stay. So the survival probability is the same. It's survival B, survival B, and now we simply have the, the probabilities of, of going from B to A or B to B. Now, what's important here, and, and hopefully, you know, if you're paying attention, you can kind of see that this must be true. If you survive, that means you're either in A or B. And so if you survive, then the, the sum of psi B A and, the, and psi B B has to be one. Okay, so if you uh, stay alive, then you have to be somewhere. So the overall probability of being in A or B is one. And so that means that the sum of the movement parameters conditional upon survival has to be one. And that becomes important for some of the things that we'll see a little bit later. So in order to, to actually statistically separately estimate survival and movement, you have to make an assumption and, and apply some constraints. But the main one is this. If we assume that the survival from time i to i plus 1 does not depend upon the state that you're going to, it depends on the state where you are at the beginning of the interval, but it does not depend upon where you're going to, then, as is shown here, we can write phi as the product of those two parameters, s and psi. Okay, But it does require that. So, for certain kinds of models, you might imagine that the survival probability should or could be, I won't say should, but could be potentially dependent upon where you go. Um, and you can handle that, but it's going to require some custom coding, and you can't do that in Mark. So in order for Mark to do what it does, it has to make this assumption. So the survival is determined entirely by where you are, the donor state, and, and that's it. All right. So if we can make that assumption, then we're probably um, pretty um, flexible in terms of the kinds of things we can do with it. And it's just essentially what Mark assumes. Okay, so I want to skip that, and I want to skip that because I don't think they're particularly relevant for what we're going to do. And let's look at the probabilities now in the context of one of these fate diagrams that we've introduced way back uh, at the beginning of the course. So here we imagine, for example, that we have an individual that's released in state B, and it flips the survival coin. So it either survives or not. If it survives, then it either stays in B with some probability, uh, or it goes from B to A with some other probability. And those probabilities are the psi parameters. And then given that it stays in B, let's say, then there's a probability of being detected. So you'd get BB, or probability that it's there, but you missed it, B0. Alternatively, if it survived but went from B to A, then there's a probability to be detected in A, and then you would have an encounter history of BA, and or it, it's not detected, and then you have B0, and then the ones that die would be B0 as well. So again, these terminal zeros require us to try to model our way through them because they could represent multiple different pathways. Um, but the basic idea of the coin flips hopefully is clear from this diagram. All right, so now we can literally take our 
meta population type model or multi-state model, and we can reparameterize it in terms of our parameters, S and Psi, and we can play all of the games that we want to be able to play. But think about how many parameters we have now. When we were doing Cormac Deli Siever, we simply had phi and P, so two parameters. Well, now in a multi-state model, we have three. We have S for survival, and it's, it's real true survival. We have Psi, the probability of moving amongst the states conditional upon survival. And then we have P, the probability of being detected in a particular state, given that you're there. So what does that do? Well, that means that the overall parameter structure is bigger. So here's a very simple situation with three states, A, B, and C, uh, and uh, four occasions. So we have three uh, parameters. and Notice the number of blue boxes, okay? So we have lots of things to take care of, but the good news is, is that everything that you know for Cormac Jelly Sieber models that you've developed a fair amount of skill with applies to um, uh, multi-state models. You just have a couple more things to keep track of. You have survival, encounter probability, and the movements. So just to zoom in a little bit, the first three blue boxes are the survivals. The next three blue boxes are the encounter probabilities, and then the remaining six blue boxes up here refer to the uh, transition or the movement probabilities. This is the psi parameter. And if you look at them, you'll notice that every one of these parameters defaults to being from a particular state to another state. So what I mean is you're in state A, state B, so you get going to B. So there's a blue box for going from A to B. There's a blue box going from A to C, why no blue box for going from A to A? Because they have to sum to one. So if you know the probability of going from A to B, and you know the probability of going from A to C, then you know the probability of going from A to A by subtraction, one minus A to C minus A to B would be the probability of going from A to A. All right, so if you think about it for a minute, it should make sense. And the same thing applies for the probabilities is going from B to A, B to C, and C to A, C to B. So the default in Mark is to estimate the probabilities of going from one state to another state. Now, we can change that. You can override that if you need to for some purposes, and there are some purposes where that becomes useful. Now, one of the things about some kinds of multi-state models, uh, particularly ones where the states represent physical locations, is that the design matrices can get really pretty complex. Um, the covariates can get complicated, and the geometry in particular can get complicated. And this diagram is really intended, even though it's with the, the phi parameterization, it, it'll give you the basic idea. So suppose that you had three physical locations, A, B, and C, and they differed in terms of their size, represented just by the size of the circle here. And, um, also by the relative proximity. So A is a little closer to B. It's obviously far away from C. The distance between B and C is bigger than B and A, and so on and so forth. And so if you were trying to model this, you'd have to deal with how do you handle the covariates, because the covariate for B to A for distance would be the same as for A to B. It's the same distance. It doesn't matter what direction you're going. Similarly, B to C is the same as C to B. And so that kind of problem is, is really where things can get ugly and difficult for design matrices. Uh, and it's not a, a characteristic of multi-state modeling per se, it's a characteristic problem for spatial models generally. So the appropriate covariates, describing the geometry properly can be difficult and, and that difficulty is reflected in the design matrix. So there's some stuff in chapter 10 in the book that goes through a worked example of this particular problem that you see and you'll, you'll quickly see that it's not the easiest thing to do. It's doable, but it just requires some care and some extra bookkeeping. All right, so what are the added complications of multi-state? So one complication is that sometimes the design matrices get really complicated. There are some other ones. For one thing, you have more parameters, right? So you've got more parameters in the general model than you had before. So if you have G groups, let's say, in, in S states, you had males and females, and you had different states, you've got a lot of PIMs. So G times S 
times that, that uh, function in the, in the brackets, you can have a lot of PIMs, and that's a lot of stuff to work with. Now, this is usually the point where I say, this is where you don't want to do this on a small monitor. And back in the day when I started doing this stuff, you know, people talked about small monitors in terms of what they have on their desktop. Laptops didn't really um, exist much, in, at least in abundance. Not everybody had one. And so this was the point where I say, there's no such thing as too big a monitor. And, and that's true. And there are certain types of models where the bigger the monitor, the better the, the, your ability to manipulate things. Doing some really complicated models on a, a laptop is challenging at best. So for the purposes of the class and the examples in the book, everything in there that you'll see, oh, excuse me, late night, um, uh, everything that you'll see is, is going to be scaled down to something that I think you could reasonably do on a laptop. So that's one problem. Um, the other thing is, is that you, you need to make sure that the transition probabilities for a given state have to sum to one. There's a logical reason that we talked about. And sometimes the standard logit link doesn't do that very well. And so the, we're going to introduce very briefly, and Gary introduced it in his talk, something called the multinomial logit transformation. And it's a little bit uh, complicated the first time you see it, but in practice, it's actually really easy to use. So we'll, we'll step through that. Uh, I think in one of our examples. And then finally, this is a point that Gary did talk about if you uh, watched his, his presentation. And if you haven't, I think you should, just so you can see Gary White in action. Um, there's a higher chance of local minima. So you remember from when we first introduced maximum likelihood theory, seems like a long time ago now, um, all of the examples that we looked at had a single mode. So, you know, you imagine the hill with just one peak at the top. And so what the the algorithms and the solvers were trying to do was to find the peak at the top of the mountain. And so if you only have a single local maxima or minima, then it's relatively easy. With multi-state models, there's actually a higher chance of having local minima. So imagine a range of mountains, and you're walking through the range of mountains, and you don't know which one the tallest one is. Okay, And so even if you flip it over on the negative 2 log likelihood scale, you don't know where the really deepest part is. So you don't know where the true global minima is, and that can create some challenges, some real challenges, in trying to come up with the best parameter estimates. And so there are a couple of, of solutions uh, that are referred to in the slide. You can try different starting values, and that often works pretty well. You can use a fairly technical approach based upon an optimization tool called simulated annealing. And in the book, although I don't talk about it here in the slide, you can also use something called Markov Chain Monte Carlo as a numerically intensive approach to explore things. And you know, generally, it's trying initial starting, different starting values is, is good. If you're going to have um, local minima, it's usually the case that you have them for the general starting model. So you kind of fuss around a little bit with the starting model, make sure you've got good starting correct estimates, and then kind of proceed from there. All right, so the standard multi-state assumptions are basically that within a state or age or sex that all the animals are equally likely to survive or move to a given location and be detected, meaning that we don't have heterogeneity, that all the animals are flipping the same coins. We also make the assumption that we made earlier or mentioned earlier is that survival is a function of the state of origin, so the donor state. Uh, and we also assume that they're all first order Markovian. So what does that mean in English? Mark assumes that the probability of making the coin flip and moving, let's say, or surviving, is only a function of where you are now. It's not a function of where you were before. And, and that's okay, except that occasionally we're really interested in situations where the probability of what you're going to do over the next time step is a function of the history of steps that you've made in the past. So a lot of life history theory, again, is predicated on that, the idea that the optimal decision of what to do now is a function of what all the decisions that you made in the past. And so you can't do those in Mark. And, and that's not a limit of Mark. Gary just decided, well, here's the problem with what are called higher order Markov problems. So second or third or fourth order is that you need buckets of data. And when you're working with situations where the detection probability is less than zero, or excuse me, less than one, um, then it's very rarely the case where you're going to have enough data to adequately fit higher order Markov models. So Gary just said, to heck with it, we're not going to build them into Mark. 
You can do it. There's some software out there that lets you do it, but you can't do it in Mark. But the good news is, most of the time, that's not going to be a real limit. Okay, so this the next one is marks do not affect survival of movement, not lost, and recorded correctly. That's pretty standard. We also assume, again, that each animal is acting independently, flipping independent coins. Again, it's pretty standard. One that's a bit of a strong assumption, uh, but it's where you start, is that the state is correctly assigned each time. Right? So you might say, well, how would that ever be pro a problem if I'm on an island, if I'm on island A and I see the animal on island A, then I know it's island A. I'm not going to get it wrong. I'm not an idiot. Um, and that's probably true. Uh, but think of a situation where the state may be a little bit harder to detect. For example, breeding state. You're looking at a herd of deer or sheep or something, and some of the females that you see are breeders and some aren't. And sometimes it's going to be not quite so obvious as to what breeding state they're in. If you see a female nursing uh, a baby or or with a baby group, you might say, "Okay, that's mom. You know, she she's a, a breeding individual." But what if you don't see her? What if you just see the female, but you don't have any other information about that individual you don't know? So it's possible you could either just make an error or you just have uncertainty. And so the simplest models, which is where you start, is that we that the states are uh, correctly assigned when you observe them. And the absolute simplest is that you observe each state. Now, we'll look at a situation where you don't uh, later on because that's that's an extension that's actually very useful for us. But the initial starting assumption is that you see every state, you see them correctly, and each state is equally likely to be observed. Not that the individuals in the states are equally likely, but that each state is observable. So we're just going to jump out here and we're going to look at a very quick uh, example based upon a putative cost of reproduction thing based on some, some deer data. And this is the example that's described initially in chapter 10. And I'll just hop out of... Uh, PowerPoint here and we'll fire up Mark just so that you can see uh, how to do this. I'm not going to do an exhaustive analysis here in the presentation. You can uh, do the work, follow it along in, in the book. I just want to show it to you uh, while you're watching this presentation just so that you can see a few things and then when you actually sit down to do it in the book it'll be hopefully a little easier. So we're going to start a new study. This is going to be the deer uh, study and for the very first time in the course we're going to click a button over here for data type that's not the default. We're not going to simply do live recaptures we're going to do multi-state encounters or recaptures only. So you click that button. You go out and you select your file it's called deer.imp and we're going to have a quick look at it to make sure that we know what it is and here's that particular data file. So what do we see? Well, first we've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight occasions. And this is a breeding, non-breeding study. So in the input file itself, I use the capital letter B to indicate that the individual is a breeder when it was encountered, and the capital letter N to indicate non-breeder when it was encountered. So it has to be a single character or a single digit. <coughs> Excuse me. But um, but nothing really different from that. So there's the encounter history, B's for breeder, N for non-breeder, and there's the frequency. So these are not individuals, these are aggregated. So we've got 85 individuals that were seen as a breeder in the first year, not seen again, and so on. Okay, so we go down here and we say eight occasions. And now because we've selected multi-state recaptures only, this little button for states that is previously grayed out uh, is available. And here, you absolutely need to click this button, Enter State Names, because this is where you're going to tell Mark what the state variables are in your input file. So one of them is N for non-breeder, and that's non-breeder, so I'll make that one that one. Uh, the default for the states that Mark gives you is B, and that's convenient because I'm actually just going to use it for breeder. And there we are. So you do need to indicate what number or letter you're using to correspond to a particular state. So this is a, a, a necessary step. Okay, click OK. And away we go. And then superficially, nothing looks much different. We look at the PIM chart, and things are, are quite different. So here's the survival blue box for the non-breeders. Here's a survival for breeders. Here's the non-breeder encounter probability, breeder encounter probability, 
probability of moving from non-breeder to breeder, probability of moving from breeder to non-breeder. So here's the, the default fully time-specific model. So I'm going to go ahead and run this, and I'm going to call this the full model for now, and I'm going to say this is the PIM model. And I'll go ahead and pick the logit link because we're obviously going to look at the design matrix in a second. And I'm going to go ahead and run it. And it, you'll see it takes a little bit longer to run because it's got more parameters. So the basic rule is the more parameters, the longer it takes for things to run. It doesn't take too long, but you'll notice it for really big problems. So there it is. We add the results to the browser. And I'll make the font size a little bigger so you folks who are playing along at home can see this. And now let's look at the design matrix. So I'm going to do design full, and you'll very quickly see something which is, I think, kind of interesting. So what do we have here? Well, we've got a very big design matrix. It's so big, you can't actually see it on the screen unless you reduce it. So there it is. So I'm waving that survival for non-breeders, survival for breeders, encounter for non-breeders, encounter for breeders. Probability of going from uh, N to B, so non-breeder to breeder, and, and then um, breeder to non-breeder. Okay, so clearly this is where having a big monitor helps. The other thing which is really important to notice is the way that Mark defaults by having a separate intercept for survival for non-breeders, and then over here a intercept for survival of breeders. What Mark is really doing here is it's treating breeders and non-breeders as separate groups. So we saw this before when we were talking about building age models and when we were talking about individual covariates. You can, and there's some reasons to do this, sometimes treat different states of something as using, you know, treating them separate groups. So you could argue that age is a state. And we saw that you could build it like this. So I'm going to run it this way, and I'm going to give it a name. So this is my full model, but using separate intercepts. And what we'll see is that we're going to get exactly the same model deviance, model likelihood fit. Everything's the same as the one that we did using the PIMS. I mean, there it is, the same deviance, 680.0540. Now, if we go back to the design matrix, though, the, this is fine, except that it's ultimately limited because you're not going to be able to build an additive model. So to build the additive model, we go to a common intercept approach. And so I'm just going to do that here. I'm going to delete, and I make this a little bit bigger. I'm going to delete, uh, or series zero out columns 1 to 14, and I'm going to start from scratch. And, and this is the design matrix that we would be most familiar with. So I'm going to zero multiple columns, which basically means turn everything back into zero, from zero to 14. There we are. And now I'm going to put in our common intercept. And this is where I need to make sure that I haven't gone too far and I'm OK. And now I put in for the breeder, one, two, three, four, non-breeder rather, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And then I have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven for the breeders, time steps. And I do the same thing for one, two, three, four, five, six. And then I have my interaction columns. One, two, three, four, five, six. And then if I wanted to be good about it, and I might as well go ahead and do it, I can label my columns. And I'm going to clear them all. This is my um, survival intercept. This is my um, state. Then I have T1, T2, T3, T4, T5, T6. And then I have my state times T1 intercept, and state times T2, state times T3. Oh, that's not very good there. Fix that up. State times T3, state times T4, state times t5, and then finally state times t6. 14 parameters, which is what we need. OK, go ahead and I'll just click that. And then it's just labeled for us. But now you'll see it. And this looks 
more familiar. This is basically identical to the standard way that we've set things up. And we could do the same thing for the encounter probabilities and then for the movement probabilities. But I'll just do it for survival here just to demonstrate the point. Um, this is the full model, but I'm going to have common intercept for survival um, and go ahead and run it. And, and it gives you the exact same model. So again, the, the whole point of doing this is that there are lots of different ways to build the design matrix. As long as they're consistent with each other, you're going to get the same estimates. You're going to get the same model things. Where they differ from each other is on the beta term. So the betas mean something different than, than they did before. OK, so that's that. Uh, what else can we do? Well, I'm going to go into my PIM chart for a second. And I'm just going to show you something. And there's a bunch of discussion about this in the book that I'll, in, in chapter 10 in the book that I'll uh, ask you to read when I send out the email for this lecture. Um, I'm going to make a constant, and I'm going to make a constant. So I'm going to pretend for the moment that the probability of going from n to b uh, is constant over time, and going from b to n is constant. And I'm going to run this, and I'm going to just call this constant default direction. So this is where Mark uses the default of going from one state to the other state. Okay, so if we click that and we run it, there it is. If we look at our estimates, and I'll just add some spacing here, the probability of going from non-breeder to breeder is 0.83, and going from breeder to non-breeder is 0.415. Now, we could calculate the probability of going from non-breeder to breeder as simply 1 minus 0.83, because if they're alive, then if they don't move from non-breeder to breeder, then they have to stay a non-breeder. So 1 minus 0.83 is the probability of that. We can also tell Mark that we want to actually have it directly calculate a different direction of the transition probability psi. To do that, we go into the PIM um, menu. And down at the bottom, you'll see Change PIM Definition. And for the multi-state model, what that does is All right, so what, what you see here on the screen then is this new window where we're going to redefine the PIMs. And it's a little bit odd, the language, and there's a couple of places where it's odd, but I'll, I'll step you through it. If you read the title of this little box that pops up, it's Select the PIM to Obtain by Subtraction. Okay, so by default, Mark gives you the probability of going, let's say, from A to B, or in our case, from um, B to N or N to B. So what it's showing you here is that you would have to, by default, calculate N to N by subtraction or B to B. So if you want to change that, you simply pull this down. So if I did the first one, so now in order to calculate the N to B, I would have to do it by subtraction. So what Mark is now going to calculate for me is the probability of being in an N and staying in an N. So I click OK, and I don't see anything else has happened. Right? If I run this model, and I'm going to just call it redefined PIM, run it, nothing has changed. The model fits the same. Everything's the same. And now, though, when I look at the real parameters, you'll see that it's giving me n to n, because I told it that I want to now calculate n to b by subtraction. So we're, we're actually in pretty good shape. Now, there's a lot of things that this will let you do. And there's a lot of clever things related to actually testing the hypothesis of potential costs of breeding, which is the premise for these data and these study. But they're all described in some detail in chapter 10, so I'm going to uh, leave it to you to look at those. So again, the, the point of demonstrating some of the things in Mark is to facilitate you the mechanics so that when then you sit down and, and work through the things in the book, you'll have a better idea of what it looks like. All right, the only other thing I want to show you right here, and it doesn't really apply particularly to um, this situation where you only have two states, but if you have more than two states, so if you have three or more, then we run into this potential problem that occasionally the probabilities will sum to something that's not one. It will sum to something bigger than one. You can avoid that in Mark by using something called the multinomial logit link function. And it's not the most difficult thing to use. You simply need to know where it is. So if I were to run 
one of these models, and it doesn't matter, I'll, I'll pick uh, one of the fully time-dependent models, and I want to run this, when I click the Run button or the Run menu, I'm going to use PARM specific. So way at the bottom of the list of link functions is PARM, which is just short form for parameter, parameter specific. So when you click OK to run now, it's not going to use the logit. It's going to do parameter specific, which means it's going to ask you, what do you want to do? All right, so if you wanted to use the multinomial logit, this is where you do it. Now, we only need to do this for the transition parameters. We only need to do this for the psi parameters. You don't see those here. Where are they? Well, it's because the box can only handle 20 at a time, so you have to click the More button to find them. Click More, and there they are. And so in order to apply a multinomial logit, you have to identify the parameters that you want to work with. So let's just look at the first psi parameter. Psi n to b is the probability of going from non-breeder to breeder over the first interval. Okay, so in order to have those parameters sum to be something, you'd have to have more than two states. So I'm just realizing this isn't going to work for this situation. So I'm actually going to hop out of here and get a situation where you have three states. Okay, one moment. Don't worry about this. Uh, discuss amongst yourselves. I'll pause this for a second, and then I'll come back and I'll show you the, the data file. Okay, and we're back. And so what I want to do now is show you an example that's based upon three states. So this is a data file which I think might be in markdata.zip. doesn't really matter. It's four occasions, three straight, straight or three states, A, B, and C. Uh, and there they are. So nothing new here. It's just four occasions and three strata. So I'm going to go ahead and start up Mark, and I'll very quickly analyze um, these data. So there's program Mark, new, it's multi-state, and I'll just call it MS example. I'll go and grab that file from my desktop, MS survive. It's got four occasions, three states, and they're called A, B, and C. So I'll just leave them that way. Uh, and click OK. Now, if I want to run this and use this thing called the multinomial logit, what I have to do is run the model, but I need to go in and say parm specific again. I made that point, but now we're actually going to be able to see it. I'll just call this demo for demonstration. And here they are. Here's all the different parameters, and we can see some of the psi parameters are over here. Um, and let's see if they're all over here. No, some of them are on the next page, so I'll go back. So let's look at the first psi parameter. So A to B, uh, and then over here is A to C. And what do we know? Well, we know that A to B and A to C and A to A have to sum to 1. So to do that, we use the multinomial logit. So how do you do that? Well, here's the first A to B transition. So this is the first interval going from A to B. You highlight it. You don't even need to highlight it. You just click in there. And then you pull down this menu and you'll see mlogit1. And the 1 means this is the first set or pair of parameters that we're going to constrain to be multinomial logit. So psi A to B for the first interval. Well, that we, now we go over here and there's psi A to C for the first interval in its multinomial logit set 1. So remember, we get A to A by subtraction. So what we're doing here is we're forcing psi A to A plus psi A to B plus psi A to C to be multinomial logit. They're grouped together. It's grouping 1, and they will sum to 1. We would do the same thing for the second interval. We would use multinomial logit 2. So multinomial logit 2 multinomial logit 2, so there's A to B and A to C for the second interval, and so on. So again, this is demonstrated and laid out in the book, but this is where it is. It's a parameter-specific link function, and the multinomial logit link is uh, entered by simply using the drop-down menu, and you simply need to pair up which transition corresponds to which other transition. And with a little bit of thought and practice, it's not too difficult. OK, so you run it, go ahead, get an evil error message that numerical convergence wasn't reached. 
and that's fine because it, it reflects the fact that it did multinomial logit for some and not all of them. It's not a big deal. At any rate, we'll ignore that for now. But that's where the multinomial logit is. All right. The next thing I want to do is just a quick demonstration. I think it's kind of a slick demonstration of how multi-state models are very, very general. So what we're going to look at is how could you use a multi-state model to basically do a Cormac Jolly Sieber analysis. So if the only piece of software you had was something that did multi-state models, the good news is you could build Cormac Jolly Sieber models, you can build dead recovery models, you can build lots of different models because the point that a lot of people start from is that a multi-state model is so general that you can basically do any other model as a special case. So there's two example data files here that are going to use cjs.imp. I'm going to analyze it as a straight uh, Cormac Jolly Sieber model. And then I'm going to do the exact same thing. I've just got a copy of it called MS for multi-state CJS. And I'm going to analyze it as a um, multi-state uh, model. Okay, so to do that, what we're going to make use of is the idea of observable and unobservable states. When you do a live encounter Cormac Jolly Sieber model, what you see on the screen right now, this unobservable states, is exactly what you're working with. Observable are the live encounters. If the animal is alive and in your study area, there's some probability that you're going to detect it. It's potentially observable. If it's dead or permanently emigrated, it's unobservable, and the encounter probability for unobservable individuals in a live encounter study is zero. So a Cormac Jolly Sieber model is a multi-state model. There's two states, live and dead. One state is observable, that's the live. One state is unobservable, that's the dead state. So that's how we can analyze things. So the data that we're going to work with, so there, there it is in a, in a sort of a graphical form. Two states, live and dead, one of them's observable and one's not. So the data we're going to work with were simulated using these true parameter values. So you'll see that phi varies over time from 0.5 up to 0.85, and p bounces around a little bit. So they're both time dependent. These little vectors and matrices here is one way that people use to represent this kind of approach that we're going to take. Um, you have two states, one and two. Well, what's the two state? Well, we're going to use the number two to represent the dead state. But the detection probability for the dead state is zero. So you don't actually have any twos in the encounter history. So P is the probability of detection for the observable state, one. Zero is the detection probability for the uh, unobservable state, two. And then what we have over here is the transition matrix. What's the probability of going from state one to one? Well, one is live. So going from live to live means surviving. That's phi. The probability of going from dead to live is zero. We don't do reincarnation modeling. And the probability of uh, going from one to dead is one minus phi. So one minus phi is the probability of dying, going from one to two. And then the probability of being dead and staying dead is one. Okay, and if you're dead, you stay dead. Again, no reincarnation here. So we're going to go ahead and analyze these data. We're going to start by just looking at the file. And it's going to be the same file we analyze two different ways. There it is. It's a Cormac Jolly Sieber mark encounter file. All ones or zeros, no, nothing else. There's no other state. And then the frequencies. So I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to run mark for these data. So here's my new analysis. This is going to be CJS data the normal way. Okay, so the standard way that we've been developing up until now. There it is. I'll run it. It has, I don't remember how many occasions, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So it's got eight occasions. And we know what the true model is. We know that the true model is fully time dependent, and that's the default model that Mark starts with. So I'm just going to go ahead and run this, and I'm going to call the model uh, true. And I go ahead and run it, and I'll go back. Pick the logit link, doesn't really matter here. And there it is. So let's look at our estimates. These will be something we're going to check on in a second. We have our final phi and p are confounded, as they always are. And if we look at our estimates and we compare them to the true parameter values, and I'll see if I can overlap them here, uh, you'll see that they're actually 
really close. So 0 0.5, 0 0.49, 0 0.85, 0 0.837, and so on for the detections. 0 0.45 is 0 0.42, 0 0.45, 0 0.44. Okay, so these are the estimates. These are simulated data, so um, they're always going to be slightly different than the true parameter values that I used in the simulation because they're just one realization of the of the stochastic coin flipping. But there's our estimates. I'm going to keep those around because what we now want to do is compare them to the multi-state version of this. So again, to treat this as a multi-state problem, we need to remember that we actually have two states, live and dead. Live is observable and dead isn't. All right, so now let's analyze our data in Mark, but we're going to do it as a multi-state problem. And to do that, I'm going to use the copy of the data set that I created. So this is CJS, the multi-state approach. It's a multi-state problem, so I have to click the multi-state button. I'll go grab the file, and I just called it MSCJS for multi-state Cormac Jolly Sieber. It's exactly the same file. If you look at it, there it is, eight occasions. The only things that are in the encounter history are ones and zeros. So one, two, three, four, so it's eight, but we have two states, right? So one is live. And two, which we never see, is dead. And remember, if you never see it, the detection probability is zero. Two doesn't show up in the encounter history because you never see it in that state. Let's click OK, and here we go. So let's look at the PIM chart. So what do we know? Well, we know a lot of things, but let's start with some of the stuff that's really easy. What's the probability of detection for the dead guys? It's zero. So I'm going to go ahead and make that box constant because we're going to set it equal to zero, but it never changes. It's always zero, so I'll make it a constant. What's the probability of the individual who is dead going back to alive? Well, it's also zero because we don't do the reincarnation. So we'll make it a constant, and I'm going to fix it to be zero shortly. What's the probability of going from 1 to 2? Well, remember what state 1 is. State 1 is live, and state 2 is dead. So right now, when I first saw this, and I suspect most of you, now that you're thinking about this, you're saying to yourself, well, the probability of going from, you know, live to, to dead, make the state transition is mortality, right? So we should leave that alone. But here's where you, you get caught. If you need to remember how Mark is partitioning things, we have two parameters. First, the coin flip, survive or not. And then if you survive, then you flip the coin. So if you survive, you flip the coin. And if you've survived, can you flip the coin to go from one to two? No, because going from one to two means going from live to dead. And if you survive, you can't go from live to dead. So it's constant and it's also zero. And this is really one of the, maybe the only, one of the two places where you have to think about it for a second. The other one that you have to think about for just a second is survival. So what's the survival of the dead guys? Well, this is where it sounds kind of silly, but if you're dead, you stay dead, which means that if you're dead at the beginning of the interval, you remain dead. So that probability of staying in the sample, which is the dead sample, is the survival or parameter, so it's going to be a 1. So here's what we're going to do. We have full-time dependence for the individuals encountered in the live state, full-time dependence for individuals detected in the live state. So there's our survival parameter and there's our detection probability. And everything else is a constant. And some of them are got to fix to one and some we have to fix to zero. And that's it. So I click close and now I'm going to run this and I'm going to use the fixed parameter button. So this is the uh, full true model. Okay, give it a name. Fixed parameters. So for the second question in the um, midterm exam, which we'll talk about at some stage, um, you'll have to do this, or you may want to do this, depending on how you set things up. Fixed parameters. Well, what do you need to fix? Well, this is where you probably don't remember what parameters that you need to fix. So if I go back out and I look at my PowerPoint, I can see nothing. That's going to help me. So I'm going to have to hmm, look at my PIM chart. So I'm going to just pause this for a second. I'm going to look at my PIM chart. And this is where you need to have a piece of paper to write down what you need to do. So parameter 8, 
is the survival of the dead guys. And I know it sounds weird, but that's what it is. So that parameter is fixed to be 1. So parameter 8 needs to be fixed to be 1. So we write that down. Parameter 16, which is the probability of detection of the dead guys, is 0. So 16 will be fixed to 0. 17 is the probability of going from 1 to 2, from live to dead. But if you're conditioning on survival, that's also 0. And then finally, the probability of going from 2 to 1, from dead to live, is, is logically 0. So parameter 8 is 1. Parameters 16, 17, and 18 will be fixed to 0. All right, so now let's run this model again. But now we're going to uh, know which parameters to fix. So you, you generally need to write these down because you're, you're likely to forget. So parameter 8 is a 1. And then the last three parameters are 0, 0, and 0. We click OK run the model, look at it, and here's our results. Now, I'm going to space this out a little bit. Uh, there's that, there's our fixed parameter, there's our encounter probabilities, and so on. So let's see if I can reduce this a little bit. And now what I want to do is I want to compare these estimates to the ones that we got doing the standard Cormac Jolly Sieber. And I'll just move things over a little bit. All right, so what do we got? 0 0.4924351, 0 0.4924, all right, so it's teeny bit different out in the fifth and sixth decimal places, but it means nothing. If you look through these, we get the same estimates. There's our fixed parameter for the survival of the dead guys, and there's our fixed parameters for the detection probability of the dead guys, and then the true transition probabilities going to and from. The final S, and the final P are confounded. They look a little bit similar to what Mark gives you for the regular, but not exactly the same. But that's OK. They're confounded. We could ignore them anyway. All right. So we just did the Cormac Jolly Sieber analysis using a multi-state approach. And there's nothing to it. Now, should you do it that way? Well, no. You shouldn't. So the point of this exercise is not to say this is how you should do Cormac Jolly Sieber. That's built into Mark, so why would you, you know, have to go through all this effort to, to do it? It's because it demonstrates that if you can think of your problem as a multi-state problem, then you can use a multi-state modeling approach to do it. And this gets used all the time because despite the fact that Mark has 175 different data types in its current incarnation. Um, smart people are coming up with new approaches all the time. And even though Gary, uh, who ostensibly is retired, although he never acts like it, um, gets things into Mark pretty quickly, um, not every model that you want is in Mark. But maybe the model you want is something that you could do as a multi-state problem. And then you could use the multi-state capabilities in Mark to get there from here. So multi-state models are very interesting in and of themselves. They allow you to ask interesting questions about state transitions. But multi-state models are also very useful, potentially, because they give you great flexibility in building models that you couldn't build at uh, any other way. All right, so that's the end of this particular lecture having to do with multi-state models. Uh, I hope it was reasonable. I think I'm getting the hang of some of the aspects of the technical side of things here. If you have any uh, comments, questions, concerns about things, or suggestions for how to improve what you're seeing or hearing, uh, do let me know, and I will do the best that I can, and uh, we'll go from there. Um, I hope everybody has a good day, whatever day you might be looking at this. I uh, hope you're healthy. I hope everyone that you know is healthy, and let's do our best to stay that way. All right, take care, everyone.